I saw the best minds of my generation destroyed by madness. Starving, hysterical, naked. Dragging themselves through the negro streets at dawn. Looking for an angry fix. Angel-headed hipsters burning for the ancient heavenly connection. To the starry dynamo in the machinery of night. Who poverty and tatters and hollow-eyed and high. Sat up smoking in the supernatural darkness of cold water flats floating across the tops of cities, contemplating jazz. jazz. On October 7th, 1955, the sixth poet at Six Gallery Reading, where Allen Ginsberg first read Howell, took place. When I became the Literary Society president, I read about the Six Gallery Reading, and it became my goal to organize a reenactment of it. I found people to perform the poems, I created a Facebook event, and at the reenactment I spoke on why this reading was so important. It's considered to be the beginning of the San Francisco literary renaissance, as well as the birth of the Beat Generation. The Beat Generation was a group of poets, artists, writers, and thinkers who questioned American society and inspired a whole generation, as well as the next generation, the movements of the 60s and 70s and even the hipsters that we consider mainstream today. I found the reading fascinating and decided to do more research. I was surprised to discover that it had been reenacted before, all over the world, from Los Angeles and New York to Manchester, England and Venice, Italy. I became obsessed. I needed to know why this poetry reading had become an historical reenactment event. A poetic ritual. I needed to know why Howell? Why San Francisco? But most importantly, why poetry? Why a poetry reading? I embarked on two road trips, one with my friend Margaret and one by myself. I went to study at the Jack Kerouac School of Disembodied Poetics at Naropa University. I visited the archives at Stanford and Columbia to figure out why. However, instead of narrating what I learned for you, I'm going to let the people I learned from do the talking. We'll be hearing from Ann Waldman, Jack Foley, Jonah Raskin, Clark Coolidge, Thurston Moore, John Burnside. I met some of the best minds of that generation along the way. Who drove cross country 72 hours to find out if I had a vision, or you had a vision, or he had a vision, to find out eternity. I wanted to know if you've heard of the Sixth Gallery from when you of were course. in Of course! When it was happening. Well, yeah, did well, you not, hear about no, the I was only reading, how, I was like, 11 years old. 11 uh, years old, but when, I, when Howell came out, I mean, my father had a copy of Howell. And... Anyway, I followed the whole gang of Howling Poets to the reading at Gallery 6 that night, which was, among other important things, the night of the birth of the San Francisco Poetry Renaissance. Everyone was there. It was a mad night. Well, it was in, in October. 1955, either the uh, 7th or the 13th, I think it was personally the 7th, Michael McClure had been asked to arrange a reading, and he was too busy to do it, so he asked his friend Allen Ginsberg, and they'd just begun to know each other, to arrange the reading. Ginsberg said he would, and he invited McClure and Philip Lymantia himself, of course, was going to read. I think that Ginsberg was largely responsible for organizing the reading and making it happen. Allen Ginsberg, yeah, he was... Um... He was open to everything. I mean, he was extraordinarily gentle soul. In California, they were far from the publishing centers of New York City and other places, Boston. They didn't get published easily. They read their poems. That was their version of publishing. That is to say, you make the poems public by reading them. Readings weren't a big thing, you know. That was kind of an early reading. That Alan kind of got imposed upon to organize, and you know, he of course took it by the the head and ran with it. Alan always did, you know, made a whole thing out of it. Crammed little space, you know, you can imagine the, the building is still there, but it's a laundry or something. Like that. It was MC by Kenneth Rex Roth, who was a, an important person, a kind of father figure to the Beats at the time, though he later became more problematically related to them. 
Kenneth Rexroth was was at the Sixth Gallery reading, and and he had a salon in San Francisco. He was a San Francisco bohemian anarchist, and when Ginsburg and Kerouac came to San Francisco, they gravitated to his place, and they went there, and they heard discussions, and they learned a lot about about haiku and Asian poetry from from Rexroth, and. To be in his place felt like being part of a sort of vital literary scene. Jack Kerouac was visiting uh, Ginsburg at the time, so Kerouac was there, though he didn't read. And I was the one who got things jumping by going around collecting dimes and quarters from the rather stiff audience standing around in the gallery and coming back with three huge gallon jugs of California Burgundy and getting them all piffed. So that by 11 o'clock, when Alva Goldbrook was reading his wailing poem, Wail, and drunk with arms outspread, everyone was yelling, go, go, go. And Reinhold Kakowethes, the father of the Frisco poetry scene, was wiping tears and gladness. So there's um, a religious element to it, especially with Kerouac giving out wine. And there's a jazz element to it, in which the poet transforms himself into the jazz musician, which Kerouac understood quite clearly. Go, man. Go, man. It's like that when Ginsburg is reading his poem. Anyway, it electrifies the audience. They suddenly realize they've heard something quite new, absolutely dirty, you know, filthy in certain ways, you know, respects shocking in certain ways, but hooray for shocking. He shifts from being this kind of nerdy guy with, with a shock of black hair and stuff and, and, and horn-rimmed glasses uh, into a bard, into the, po the poet with a capital P. It's, it's an amazing transformation. And that's what the poem is about, but the audience could see it and feel it as he begins to read it. It's an amazing thing. And that's what they responded to. They responded to that sense of transformation. And if he could do it, they could too. It's a demonic poem. People were still kind of like, oh, man, that was, that was wild. You know, it was, you know with Kerouac on the stage, Gary Snyder also was one of the readers. And it was mostly when Snyder read, after Howell kind of floored the room, he was able to engage other people there still. It was McClure's first reading. It might have been Snyder's first reading as well. They all became famous poets, but they were not at the time. It seems to be very prescient of Gary Snyder to say that it would be a poetical bombshell. But I think it was because he just sensed that here were all these young poets from, but basically from the East Coast, like from Kerouac and Ginsburg, from being around New York, and then the the Pacific Northwest Northwest Coast guys, Whalen and and Snyder, and that they this was this conjunction and this, that was coming together. And he'd been around, he'd met Ginsburg and Kerouac and heard about them and. They seemed like legendary people already. It took place in this reformed, rearranged garage. It had been an automotive uh, garage. It had been other things before that, a carriage shop. It had very high ceilings. There were no lights. There were no problems with lights. That is, it wasn't dark. You saw the audience. The audience was right there. But in those days, most of the poets who read were just, they held the book and they kind of buried their face in the book and they didn't really look up at the audience very much. It was more like a reading than a performance. The audience was a participant. It didn't have the, the traditional divide between the people on the stage and the people in the, in the audience who were the observers. It was a fairly small space. It was packed. It was a remarkable event because uh, Lawrence Ferlinghetti was there. Lots of uh, Ginsburg's friends were there, uh, including Neil Cassidy and and Natalie Jackson, and a lot of people who'd been who were poets and part of the the hipster scene in the city. So Anne Charters, who's written about the Beats, and brilliantly, very bright person. She saw the first complete reading of Howell in Berkeley. She liked the reading, but she was shocked by the audience, which seemed to be free floating, bohemian, sexy drinking, you know, smoking pot, I mean, you know, name it. It was a bohemian scene that shocked her. Well, that was the condition of the Sixth Gallery, too, that it was a shocking but liberating event when Ginsburg read that poem with all those dirty words which his father told him to eliminate. It is, in a certain sense, that poem is anti-literature. 
It was Ginsburg's first reading. It's his first public reading. He had never publicly read before the Sixth Gallery reading. This is the first time he ever read it. That's another remarkable thing about it. When you think of, you know, like, and he comes out and he reads that. He doesn't read, like, earlier pieces of, of poetry. He reads it all. You know, and, uh, but with no ambition about it, just like, okay, this is going to be, I'm going to break down the doors of this. He's just like, it's something I'm working on. This something new. It was a remarkable event because suddenly Ginsburg became famous. There wasn't really a beat generation in, in October 1955. I mean, there were people who called themselves hipsters who listened to jazz and smoked marijuana and they were on the fringes of society. But I think that, that, that um, there was a bohemian world in San Francisco or a continuation of bohemian culture that had thrived in San Francisco beginning in the, in the 20s and, and, and the 30s. It's a celebration. It's a coming together of a community. It's not just one single artist or two artists. Between poets, Reinhold Kakoethes in his bow tie and shabby old coat would get up and make a little funny speech in his snide funny voice and introduce the next reader. But as I say, come 11.30, when all the poems were read and everybody was milling around wondering what had happened and what would come next in American poetry, he was wiping his eyes with his handkerchief. And at the end of the poem, Kerouac turned to Rexroth and said, you know, this poem is going to make Allen Ginsberg famous from the Bay Bridge, which connects Berkeley to Richmond, from the, from the Bay Bridge to the Golden Gate Bridge. And Rexroth said, it's going to make him famous from the Golden Gate Bridge to the Brooklyn Bridge. You know, he, had, he, he realized that it was going to make, it was a national poem. It, just, it, it, was, it was just there in the sort of the right time, the right moment, really, that to express how, how the generation was feeling. And then and on, in different parts of the world, also in, in Eastern Europe, uh, this sort of weariness with bureaucracy and the Cold War and the sort of fear of the bomb and not willing to sort of live in fear and to cower, but, but to, to, to cry out. I think that's why I called it like a sort of animal scream. And we all got together with him, the poets, and drove in several cars to Chinatown for a big, fabulous dinner off the Chinese menu with chopsticks, yelling conversation in the middle of the night in one of those free-swinging great Chinese restaurants of San Francisco. And then there was the kind of the critical reception to the, to the poem in, in a lot of the little magazines of the day of people like Norman Pedoritz attacking it and, <laughs> and blaming Kerouac and Ginsburg for juvenile delinquency and really made Allen Ginsberg feel really sad to, to be so misunderstood. And also the fact that the New York Times ran an article about how before it was even published as a book. Uh, Richard Everhart came out to, to San Francisco because he'd heard that, that the, young poets were performing their work and and, and that that was that was something new that, that I don't know if it's ever happened again for the New York Times to write about a poem before it's published as a book I remember when I first heard about it I, I mean certainly by the time uh, the Dharma poems came out Kerouac described it in there um, I, I, that might have been the first time I really knew about it. I mean, there, there was, you know, there weren't history books about this stuff then. It was all kind of word of mouth, and, you know, I hadn't, I hadn't met people like Alan at that point. And, you know, maybe I heard a rumor or something, you know, but, it, you know, it wasn't a big media event. It was just a small event in the local neighborhood. Who sank all night in some marine light of Bickford's floated out and sat through the stale beer afternoon in desolate fugazis, listening to the crack of doom on the hydrogen jukebox. The poem comes from someplace very deep inside Allen Ginsberg. It's very American kind of expression. The idioms are very American. American places and people and language. and It's a work of art. We tend to think of it as, and he did too, as, you know, the visions of, the, the unspeakable visions of the individual, as Kerouac said. But it's a poem full of different kinds of voices different kinds of experiences, different stories. It's a poem that moves us towards multiplicity.
Now he's influenced here by Pound and even by Eliot in certain ways. He's got this very also influence of surrealism, the French surrealists, like an image of like the drunken taxi cabs of absolute reality. So there's a lot of things that are very much like Walt Whitman in the poem. Uh, T.S. Eliot, I mean, I think Hydrogen Jukebox is a kind of image that, that Eliot would have appreciated. And, and The Wasteland is also a poem about the disintegration of the civilization that he knew. And Powell is, yes, yeah, is kind of about this, this sort of falling apart of America, this, this old, the old America. and this sort of birth of, of this new generation who, with, who have these people who have visions and they're on a quest and they're searching for America. This is, I quoted you something from someone named Clotaire Rapaille uh, in a book called The Culture Code. This is what Rapaille says. The American culture exhibits many of the traits consistent with adolescence. Intense focus on the now, dramatic mood swings, a constant need for exploration and challenge to authority, a fascination with extremes, openness to change and reinvention, and a strong belief that our mistakes warrant second chances. As Americans, we feel we know more than our elders do. All of that is a wonderful description of how. Let's, I'm not calling Ginsburg an adolescent, but I am saying that adolescence expresses some of the things that he felt the need to express in his poem. And he felt he got it. You know, he said he, he actually at one point says it's practically an imitation of Jack Kerouac. Marlon Brando in The Wild One and, and James Dean and, and, and rock and roll. I know that both Kerouac and Ginsburg were aware of the development of rock and roll, that they were that young people were, were changing really before their eyes. And, and for a time, Kerouac was thinking of calling on the road rock and roll road, which is really a tribute to the influence of, of rock and roll, just you know, sensing that there's this new generation and they, they, that in a lot of ways they feel linked to this new generation, younger generation, more than to their own peers who they knew, knew from the 40s. These people were interested, Ginsburg was interested in jazz. Charlie Parker. Other great soloists had the quality almost of a poet presenting his work. And Jack Kerouac took Charlie Parker as his symbol, a kind of emblem for the writer, for the poet, in Mexico City Blues, which had not yet been published, but which Ginsburg had read. And Ginsburg, too, sees Howell as a kind of jazz solo. So what's happening here is that poetry is getting this strong infusion of the oral. It changes the nature of what it means to encounter a poem. Suddenly, the amount of energy that's happening with an oral reading is quite different from the kind of energy that you have from just reading with your eyes. Now, later, Howell becomes an exemplar of great literature. It becomes something that, that in fact, is being attacked in the poem at the same time that it's being affirmed, because he's also, at the same time that he's talking dirty, and deliberately so, and putting it in your face. At the same time that he's doing that, he's also saying he's a great poet, and his antecedents are Whitman, and Rimbaud, and you know, whoever, etc. Et he's a saint in a certain respect. And he, he, he wants that aspect too. The saint is kind of the redemption of the dirty boy who's also talking. Being in San Francisco in, in, the, in 1955, and looking back at New York, and I think there's a lot of Kerouac in the poem, and there's and there's some and burrows and they're certainly all they're all characters it's sort of like they're with him as he's writing the poem and performing the poem who blew and were blown i mean you know all of that the whole poem is all about taking something which most people would regard with horror and disgust and saying it's great it's marvelous and that's why it's an attack on so many american values it's why lionel trilling hated the poem even though he was Ginsburg's teacher at one time and uh, it's an attack on everything that Lionel Trilling held dear, on culture, on everything that a good liberal would like. It's an amazing poem in that respect. Now later it becomes something that's defended by good liberals, that's another question. Yeah. But its initial thrust is its shocking, in-your-face quality, which at the same time is holy. It, well, it's, it is a spiritual poem, 
like the wasteland. Of course, Ginsberg turned increasingly to Buddhism and, well, he had a phase of Hinduism and there's also a lot of references to Christ and Christianity in, in the poem. It also reminds me that, that Farrell and Getty said that, you know, the poem is, this is not an obscene poem, it's a, it's a poem that's pointing out the obscenity of our materialistic warlike culture. There's this element of the secret that's very, very, very important, that this is the secrets of my heart that I'm giving you. This is what I really feel. I'm a gay man and I'm not going to hide it. I'm this, that, and the other thing and I'm not going to hide it. And I enjoy it. And I don't care if you think it's obscene. He's turning it around. They call you Beat Generation. The word Beat, Kerouac gets this from Herbert Hunky. He's looking around, Kerouac is looking around for a word like lost to describe this generation. You know, Hemingway's generation was the lost generation. What's our generation? So he's looking around for a word, preferably four-letter word, to describe this generation. And he's been watching these hipsters in Times Square, and they take heroin, they're interested in jazz, they're fascinating to Kerouac. He's been watching all these guys. And one of them, Herbert Hunky, walks up to them. He's just very tired. And he says, man, I beat. And Kerouac looks at him. You sure are. He's got his word. Now, Kerouac is French, Canadian. And French, in, in French Canadian, B-E-A-T means something. Beat. It's, it has an accent and it's pronounced Beat. It's not pronounced Beat, but it's pronounced Beat. Uh, but it means blessed. So you've got these poles on the one hand, beaten down totally, weary. I'm so tired. I saw the best minds of my generation, starving, hysterical, making, totally beaten down. Beat in that sense. At the end of the poem, everything is holy. That's beat. Beat means blessed uh, in French. Uh, beatitude, it's the same word. How moves from being beaten down, beat in that sense, to at the end of it, beatitude, ecstasy, religious ecstasy. Everything is holy, as he says with Blake, citing Blake. And that's yeah. the, 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 the story of the poem, that we move from one to the other and that both are present. I think the basic, the core idea of the beat philosophy or viewpoint of, of life is that people who are literally beaten down have something angelic or beatific about them. That, that it's a celebration of Americans who are marginalized and on the fringes of, in, of Indians, of people who are exiles and outcasts. and. And, and, and it, the, the poem does, I think it's aiming to sort of knit together uh, those people and, and to see that the spirituality, the spiritual beauty in poverty and homelessness and it's, the beauty doesn't, it's not just like in a museum or in, in, in the worlds of affluence. You can see beauty in Negro streets at, at dawn of, of people looking for an angry fix or even in sort of madness, you know, the Mohammedan angels up on the up roof. He said to me once when we were talking during the interview that there were certain things he realized that way madness lies, that way Naomi lies. If you go too far in that direction, you're going to turn into a crazy person like your mother. Don't go too far that way. But at the same time, don't hide the madness. It's, it's, it's this kind of situation in which the craziness is partly a kind of attack on proper literature. What, in the 50s, you grew up with people who uh, used, as a positive term, the term crazy. and meant good. But his mother's crazy, and he doesn't like that. You know, it's, it's a complicated, again, it's crazy. Crazy, man, but yeah, crazy is disturbing. Um, at what point is crazy liberating? At what point is it disturbing? In a culture that seems too quiet, madness seems like a liberation. But madness caused by the culture, in another sense, is one way the culture controls you. His mother was totally controlled, she's in an institution. It's not liberating, it's the opposite of liberating. Mm -hmm. And he knows that. 
And both those feelings are in the poem. And his letters to Kerouac when he was inside the New York State Psychiatric Institute show that he was he was already thinking of evolving a, like a poetics or an aesthetics around madness. And that, of course, also linked to his mother's life and his mother's experience. Ginsburg's poem, because it was a poem. What can a poem do? You know, a poem doesn't have any power, right? Poem, right? Just a poem. It, it brought into the mainstream both Ginsburg and the themes that he was talking about. Who let themselves be fucked in the ass by saintly motorcyclists and screamed with joy. I think the best publicity you can get is to be banned. You know, it's, it's, it's worked throughout history. Lady Chatterley's Love was not a very good book, really, by dear Lawrence's standards. But everybody wanted to read it because it was banned. Henry Miller. Everything of his was banned, and pretty much everything of his was banned in the United States until the, until the late 50s into the 60s. So I think the banning of books was always great publicity because people turn up to hear something and think it's, you know, it's dangerous or it's edgy. My parents subscribed to Life magazine. It came to the house and there was an issue that had a photographic essay about the, the trial of Hal in San Francisco. It had one of the lawyers in the courtroom waving the book it said how that's how i heard about it i knew about kerouac i knew about on the road um so i wanted to get a copy of of how i t i took the train from the small town where i was living and went into uh, manhattan there was a bookstore on sheridan square in manhattan and i got how and paid for 75 cents and took it back home and and then on Monday, I took it to school and showed all my buddies in school about this poem. So. And there were lots of people like that, lots of us like that, who shared the poem. And Well, the government wanted to censor the poem. They arrested the Shig, who was at the cash register in City Lights, and they also arrested uh, Ferlinghetti, and they put him on trial for obscenity, and they, so they wanted to remove the the the, uh, the book from from shelves and not have anybody read it so there that was a kind of as a as being a teenager it was you felt like or i felt and i know other people did as a part of like a kind of secret conspiracy of of young readers who shared the poem and shared the view of the poem and the times were the times were dark and dreary and kind of anticipate some of the rebellion of the 60s of people coming out of their apartments and going into the streets. Prophetic poem. It's a shocking poem, but they had to defend it as if it were a tale of two cities. <laughs> you know, this is a far, far better thing I do than I have ever done. That kind of thing. They had to defend it as if it were uh, something that isn't shocking. But it's meant to shock. And it's not just a coincidence that the Beats and, and Allen Ginsberg reached out to William Carlos Williams, who'd been a, who was a modernist, and that, that William Carlos Williams, you know, wrote the preface or introduction to Hal, and it was sort of like a member of the older generation, somebody who's part of the modernist movement, saying, you know, here's this new young poet, and you know, you've got to listen to him, and he, he was a mentor of, of Allen Ginsberg's. It would be very rare for poetry to have a spotlight thrown on it, contemporary poetry, to have a spotlight thrown on it by the press or the media. It would be very rare. It would be, you know, you'd have to do something strange to make poetry interesting to the mass media. The only things that can make poetry interesting to mass media are things like, you know, putting the guy on trial for obscenity or, you know, Alan Ginsberg taking all his clothes off and doing a reading, which he did a couple of times. Or, you know, some, some scandal involving the poet or... You know, those, those are the things people are interested in en masse. Poetry is, is a relatively minority kind of art, or contemporary poetry is, but um, that's because it's, you know, it's, it's difficult for people to interpret and understand if they, not, if they don't want to study in depth. And so poetry is generally marginalised, contemporary poetry is generally marginalised, until the next generation or generation beyond that, when it really does begin to have a real social impact on people. What the Wasteland did for the generation of people after World War I, Hal did for the generation of people who came of age after World War II. In the sick, people were still reading 
Howell in the 60s. Uh, Ginsburg, he was a witness for the defense in the in the Chicago conspiracy trial and read from Howell and it, it, it certainly informed and educated a lot of people who became hippies and, and rebels in the 60s. Yeah, people would, went off to Mississippi to protest against segregation with on the road and Howell in their back pockets. I think most, the most important thing was the, was the kind of social impact drawing attention to the way America was lying to itself. And when people started paying attention to the beats, it wasn't until really till the end of the 50s into the 60s. While there were social critics in the 40s and into the 50s, hardly anybody knew about them anyway. It's interesting to think, did they have any real social impact? Were well, they merely an inspiration to a new generation of people who were more directly involved in trying to change society? As Allen Ginsberg said, you know, um, he, didn't, he didn't want to change. He didn't want to create a social movement. He just wanted to make poems and, and, and enjoy life and express themselves. It's a poem that crosses all kinds of boundaries, international boundaries. How it's been translated into more than two dozen languages. And Russian poets would get together with Ginsberg and Ferlinghetti and had readings in Albert Hall and uh, in, in the 60s, early 60s in London. It sparked a lot, sort of a kind of global brotherhood of, of, of poets and who really sort of defying the sort of cold law rigidities. And they want people to be able to, live, to be allowed to live more naturally and more spontaneously. I think it's the most important part, spontaneous. That doesn't mean you just do the first thing that comes into your head. It means you have to learn how to live in the world and then you can be spontaneous. It's a long process. And that's why you first have to learn how to be and then you can be, before you can be spontaneous. It does seem like it's, if I can include you, there's a number of young women who are turning to Howl and appreciating it and, and, and kind of re, remaking it as a, as a poem for women, as a, as a feminist poem. On October 7, 1955, at the Sixth Poet at Sixth Gallery reading, was a cataclysmic and historic event. It burst open the door of the American soul and publicly discussed for the first time major issues that are still hotly debated. Homosexuality, mental illness, the military-industrial complex, and environmentalism. It foreshadowed the revolutions of the 60s and 70s. It also transformed poetry readings into a form of popular entertainment. It was one of the first public performance poetry events, and also the first to use posters and postcards to publicize it. This form of the poetry event, as an entertaining, performance-based reading, influenced poetry scenes all over the world. The style of Howell, as well, had a major influence on international and national poets. Its emphasis on using the poetic form to express human truths and nakedness, as well as to discuss intimate thoughts and political issues reverberated in the conforming, paranoid Cold War period. Howell, a counterculture poem written and performed by Allen Ginsberg, has become a part of the American literary canon. It has become a ritual reenacted in cities all over the world that celebrate, remember, and relive that moment of transformative truth in 1955. And it should continue to be celebrated and remembered and relived. It will. But also it should continue to question our society, to be dangerous, to shock. With the absolute heart of the poem of life butchered out of their own bodies, Good to eat a thousand years. Well, it was hard not to meet Allen Ginsberg in, in New York in the 60s. I mean, <laughs> I mean he was there at, at parties, he was there at demonstrations. When I was at Columbia, I had some friends who were students and, and who were also poets, and they would, I mean, they would go and visit Allen Ginsberg, and then they would, like, <laughs> they would come back and, and, and talk about what it was, you know, what he had said or what he had done, and, and in some ways he just seemed 
he he seemed a little nutty, actually. You know, really. <laughs> I mean, because he wasn't always trying to make a lot of sense.